Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to explain a few things, um, first of all, about Telefonica, just to give you a perspective and a framework in which I'm then going to explain and talk through a specific project that we've been running over the last 12 months, which I think pulls together a number of the areas we've been discussing today. So it's not necessarily a fully technical discussion, although there is some technology in there. It's not really a business piece either, but there is some business in there. So what I'm going to try and explain is the elements as, as we've developed and delivered a big data project that we've had to modify actions and the way in which we work with our businesses and the way in which we actually deliver the solution. So the solution I'm going to talk about today is network optimization. Now, it's something obviously from a telco perspective is really important. It's about where we put our masts, so where we can capture our customers and then actually deliver the best service. Which is a bit of a dichotomy if we think about it to start with. Normally digital transformation is about our business and our customers, how the customers are going to be digitally improved. From our perspective it's twofold. We not only have to improve the lives of our customers through a digital transformation in terms of the service we offer, we also have to do our own digital transformation off the back of that with our legacy systems to actually ensure that the data information that's coming from our customers is efficiently, and man is efficiently managed and effect efficiently acted upon. So within that framework, Telefonica. Most of you probably know Telefonica from our continued ownership of O2 in the UK. Now what I'm not going to talk about today is the UK. I'm going to talk about our LATAM operations. Now, 260 million customers worldwide, the majority of those are sitting in LATAM. As you can also imagine, the development process and the market situation in each of those countries that we operate, about 19, is fundamentally different in each. So my team, working above that framework, are working to de deliver new and innovative capability. Why do we do that? Each of the local teams have got their own business intelligence and CRM teams that deliver and produce traditional analytics. That traditional analytics is developed in-house internally and normally focuses on business and operations for about the next 12 to or about up to about 12 months ahead. Where we come in as a global team and I've got a team of about 20 people who work for me and I'll explain the structure that we operate slightly later on. But that team then looks at things 18 months, two years ahead of the game, working closely with our innovation and our research teams to actually provide new capability based on new data variables, which in our space is in three main areas. It's around mobility, so tracking customers' mobility, it's around web profiling, so understand people's traffic through their handset on web. And also in terms of natural language processing, in terms of customer call centers. So those are the three areas we, we class as big data and would traditionally and would actually now sit separately in different data sets than our historical traditional legacy systems. So I'm talking about being able to develop capability on those new solutions and environments that can then work alongside our traditional data to deliver business benefit. So how do we do that? First thing we found when we started this, a lot of these journeys on big data was all of our businesses coming from the traditional space wanted to look at it from a technology. They wanted the new sexy toys, they wanted to put a big data Hadoop platform up and then what do they do with it? They didn't know. So we turned that around and actually said, if out of those three areas of data sets we've, I've just explained, we were able to get that data, how would you as a business act differently? So what we were finding was that we were getting the drive from the business with a specific use case to enable us to start small scale. So we're not looking at putting 200 servers into an into a individual country because they can and because they need it. Actually, we're starting small scale in terms of up waiting and getting and collecting new data sources to then run activity and pilots on. So for this particular activity network optimization, we had a business case that we wanted to integrate customer data 
and network data for the first time in the business. I know that sounds strange from a telco, but the two areas hardly ever talked. And how we can then make a global solution in terms of the investment decisions we make at the end of the process around where we put those masts and how that relates not necessarily to the technology side of things, but more about where the demand is coming from from our customers. So as I said earlier, it's actually a twofold approach. So from a business perspective, what we're looking at is we've got a technology complexity, and I'll explain a little bit about that in, in later on. From a business perspective, then technology complexity, we've got limited budget, and one of the main drivers is around service experience, making sure that the customers get the best experience. But from a customer's perspective, it's quite simply emotion. Can I connect when I need to connect? It's an immediate demand. So whatever we develop has to fulfill those requirements. And it's also about access. People, are new, or not surprisingly, don't stay in one place when they use their mobiles. They used to when we had a fixed line service. That's fundamentally changed now. So we're looking at not just where they access home or work, it's actually that whole journey time as well. And ensuring that if we're delivering a solution for those customers who are paying for a 4G service, they're actually getting it at all points of their journey. So let's talk a little bit about the technology and platform. If we know what the business case is and we know we need new data and we need new data sources, what do we do? Here, we made a big decision in terms of um, big data probably about a year, year and a half ago, in terms of we, like a number of com companies have already presented this over the course of today, um, we went Horton Works. Reason for that is within those 15, 19 countries we've got, we've probably got 50 different platforms and 50 different systems that are currently working from a legacy perspective. So whenever we created new solutions from a central position, we weren't able to deploy them in country or we were restricted to only the countries that had got quite a developed market or quite a developed or a standard stack of data sets and solutions. So what we decided to do was to provide an architecture from the centre for big data to create their data lakes with an, as an open source solution as possible. The reason for that, not only for the Horton Works piece, is that all our solutions are now designed using open source solutions. So we've moved away from the traditional SaaS and the more software-based solutions to more bespoking R, Spark, Hadoop, and all of those things that sit naturally on a Hadoop platform. What we didn't want to do was to have the different solutions or different versions of Horton Works running and then not being able to deploy in all countries. So it was a centralization play for the technology. Two elements to that. First one was, as we were starting to pull data from the network teams, we had to go through two stages. A, actually access and get the data from the network teams, who were very reluctant to let it go. Secondly, then work through a systems team and a and its historical legacy ISG-based uh, function to actually then get access to that data and also introduce new solutions. So to move away from an environment that was very traditional into allowing a lot more flexibility. That flexibility was from a data lake. And actually one example um, of one of the countries we worked with a couple of years ago was within this solution, um, I said at the start we had um, countries that led from a technology perspective this country, Czech Republic, actually the BI director decided he wanted to create his own environment, stuck a PC under his desk, took a feed from the network guys, and within two to three weeks he was actually producing results from the big data environment that he was now capturing. So we were using these types of examples to show how small level investment, collection of new data sources, were then actually giving and delivering business benefit from day one. Team is critical. Um, we've spoken a lot, or there's been a lot of talk about data scientists, unicorns, trying to get the, the best people. The team that I run is what we call, euphemistically, a global unicorn team. It's not made up of one unicorn, it's made up a team of them. And that team involves data scientists, data wranglers, data journalists, and data engineers. 
because if we're delivering a solution, we need all of those four skill sets in actually deploying and making that, that activity work in country. For this particular activity, in terms of the network optimization, not only did we have my team doing the development work, we also then had a project team from the global area as well supporting it. So we introduced more complexity, but we had to then make sure that that complexity didn't slow the project down. We've also got a, a sophisticated and probably quite well developed local team development process. We heard from TFL just a minute ago around how do you get the teams or the traditional teams moved up into, a big data in, into the big data in space, upskill them effectively. What we've got is a number of programs. A, through the solutions that my team deliver, we go in country and deploy that solution. So as we do that, we talk to the local countries. If there's any training we need, R, Spark, Hadoop, we do that locally and we train and upskill those teams in that process. In parallel to that, we've got our own university system in Telefonica supporting and training people and training specific countries to upskill in the new skill sets. We actually did a, um, a training session probably about two or three months ago in our London office. Um, alongside that, we've obviously got Coursera, courses, etc. So in terms of the education, not only is it for the local teams, but for my team as well, we make and ensure that that training is continuous and that training is developed and that training is pushed in terms of ensuring that that team and my team stay at the leading edge of understanding within big data solutions. So... We got the team together, we got the technology platform, we got the business case. What's the next thing? Obviously the analysis. We've now got the data, what do we do with it? Okay, for this particular activity, we've now ended up with about 350 data variables that go into the model to predict in terms of network optimization. What does that network optimization tool do? At the start, we've had three iterations of this model. We took two and 3G data and understood where that was being used and consumed. The next stage that we've just developed is introducing the 4G side. Reason we have to do that is as you make your journey with your phone, um, there's basically a waterfall effect on each mast. So if there's no 4G on one mast, your phone automatically drops to 3G or drops to 2G. So, for the purpose of network optimization, it's not necessarily the technology you're connecting with is the one that you want to connect with. So if we're looking to predict and invest and optimize our network, we've not only got to know when you can't connect to the right level, we also need to know to ignore or adapt when you're at a level that you don't want to be at. So there's quite a bit of complex analysis going on in that place, that space. There's also an understanding in terms of ROI, in terms of if we invest in a 4G mast, what do we lose within that environment? So there's, a net, there's an understanding from that side. One of the biggest challenges, um, and that was where the data wrangling came in, specifically within our team, was actually, and this may sound a bit strange, some of our masts move around the, move around the country. Physically, they don't, but when they've got an attribute or a number that says that mast is there in one part of the year and in another one the other year, if they re-score re, uh, or reskill the, um, the, the attributes, then you've got a problem. So what we had to introduce was a standard way of measuring and understanding basically the global or the environment that our customers were working in. So we had to basically take every country that we've worked in and create a one by one K grid to then allocate people to those one K grids so that we know people where they are, at what time, how much data they're consuming, how much voice they're consuming, whether they're on the right network or whether they're on the right level of network that they need to be. All of those decisions have to go into a network optimization investment pro program. So with all that in mind, we then had to create a product. So that product, and we've got a marketing strategy whereby we actually develop um, 
cartoons or whatever for each of our products to explain and help sell them internally in our market. And that's our, what we're, the um, network optimization project internally is called Golden Clusters because we're looking for golden clusters within our network about where we need to invest. So the idea here is to develop and create that product from those things. So I've already spoken about the data wrangling that we had to do. Now again, there was no standard data model for each for the global approach. Each country had its own standard data model. So one of the early parts we had to do was to start building and defining that data model from scratch from the countries. So not only have we done that, we've done, local, we've done data processing. Now legally, whilst the cloud environment might seem an ideal solution for us, legally we're not allowed to move our data from countries in most examples. So we have to actually process locally as well. So we're constrained by where we can process. In some respects, from a big data perspective, that's actually good, because if you start moving your big data and all your, by definition, all your big data out into the cloud, you've got a time lag between the processing and actual app being able to access it. So holding it locally is a benefit, but there are some restrictions, especially from a legal side, that gives us a problem. Similarly, as I said, on the technology we've approached, Apache is our source and solution, and we use all open source to design and build the solutions with that idea in mind of then deploying locally and being able to install it in the country. So what have we done and what do the deployments look like? This example is in Buenos Aires in Argentina. So what we're seeing there is the main part of Buenos Aires from three different perspectives. So, two important points here. One, obviously customer value to us is important, and this was one of the new elements that we were introducing to our, to our calculations for network optimization. So rather than investing where it's technologically easier to do, we were starting to look at where our customers are spending money and where our customers are demanding the new solutions, where should we invest? So the three examples there are actually the three levels, gold, uh, silver, bronze, and platinum, in terms of where the customers are actually using that data. So what we see here is two examples, and basically the top one is where we're getting revenue from, and the bottom one is where our problems are. So it's no great surprise that actually where we have bad network or network congestion, we're not actually optimizing the value that we can get from those areas. And again, that was one of the key learnings we got from this. So the results, what have we actually looked at and how, we, how are we developing and using those results? Well, as I said, what we've got is a mixed environment. In any country, we've got 2G, 3G and 4G masts. The, the requirement from this project is to predict where we should invest and fast track the 4G masts for customer benefit. What do we have to take into account in terms of those results? We've got to look at servicing. In some instances, you don't want to invest in a mast because all you need to do is service the 3G mast and actually give you a better solution. Similarly on reception, putting a 4G mast in might blast out larger into a further area but actually it might then cause problems as well. So you've got to consider the existing environment as well as improvements on reception, given that the customer demand is reception needs to be ever ready. Then looking at new sites in terms of our results, where we want to put totally new sites and where we want to invest in some of those areas. Sometimes that has to be from le uh, is driven legally or contractually, in a lot of the LATAM countries, we have to invest and actually put masks into areas that may not actually give us a return, but we're legally committed to help support and develop infrastructure. The last one I've thrown in, you may not be able to see this totally, number 10, Pokemon Go. Interesting case study here. Um, I, I was lucky enough to be in Guatemala a couple of months ago where we were doing a new deployment of this solution, in fact, and... That was the week or the second week that Pokemon Go was launched. What we were actually seeing was, and if you think about this in the context of a network, we were suddenly seeing areas where there'd been no use before, and suddenly there were huge groups of kids arriving and going to this area. 
what we were then able to do was actually use the same cheat codes that a lot of those guys are using to then understand from an X and Y or lat and long where the kids were likely to end up if they were chasing Pokemons. So what we can then start to do is to then adapt those investment decisions based on some of that criteria. So not only do we need to do it from a, from a longer term perspective, we also need to look at it from an immediacy or things that are changing totally out of our control, like Pokemon. So finally, in terms of the future, what are we looking at? Well, technology is moving forward, as we know. People are using more and more power or requiring more and more power and speed on our network through handsets. The corollary or the downside of that is that data and cost is reducing. So we've got to be more efficient about how we understand A, how the handsets work with our network and B, how that then delivers a service to the customers. We're looking at huge data growth. Um, in terms of our data consumption, if we start even two years ago, or even one year ago, very low levels of data, and actually in a lot of our businesses, pre-big data, we couldn't see what that data consumption was from the customers. Big data's given us the opportunity to now use and understand the data consumption in terms of access to the web, those types of things. Finally, and an overarching constraint, is still around legislation. I've deliberately used the Latin American examples because legislation is slightly less strict there. If I was to, use, to give this example in where we're speaking in, or where we're working in UK, Germany, etc., the legislation is a lot stricter in terms of customer ex experience, customer uh, access, etc., and what we are and aren't allowed to do. We take a central view from a brand perspective, so we apply higher standards in our LATAM countries than we are expected to deliver, and we work within the framework of the European constraints as well. But legislation in terms of, A, with the legislator asking us to deploy and put in masts, and then also restricting us in terms of how we can then use that, does provide a challenge. Thank you, and any questions? Please, ah, oh, yes, great, we have one. Thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, may I ask, uh, what kind of customer data did you use other than you know, basic transactions like you know, call logs and so on? Uh, and what were the significant challenges you faced in the area of analytics? Uh, okay. In the project? So um, basically anything you think we can do with your handset, we can and probably do. So in terms of what customer data we've got for Depending on the country, depending on the technologies, it goes from summarized CDR level, which or CDR customer data record, from where you started the call and where you ended the call, to individual tracking on every mast and every transaction you do between two masts. So real time, basically, analytics. So if you're walking down Oxford Street, we can track you virtually to store frontage if you're on your handset. So we've got that data set. Additionally, any of the apps um, or any web browsing that you tend to do outside of HTTPS or outside of the, tr the, the, the standard apps, we can track and, and understand. Again, the framework for the network optimization piece was service provision. So in, in a lot of respects, we can use that data that we can't use for marketing, but we can use it for service provision, because it's enhancing and improving the customer experience. So from that perspective, it's basically a hell of a lot of data in answer to your question. Um, in terms of the analytics, uh, we've actually had a long history of analytics. So in a lot of respects, it wasn't that difficult. The more difficult part is getting it deployed into the countries and actually getting it working in a way that can allow the countries to monetize that data and that understanding quickly. 
So from an analytical perspective, we had a, we've got a long history of developing products. This solution was actually built off of our mobility model. So we already had in most countries a customer mobility model that preloaded and analysed and worked out homework and top 10 locations that a customer goes to. So from that framework, we were then able to just improve the way in which we use that data. So I think from the analytics side, it was fairly easy. Customer data a challenge, standardization and getting it into the countries were the bigger challenges. Okay? Okay, if there's no more questions, thank you very much.